Um, for all the air propagation we've looked at thus far, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and powers, uh, those all scale in uh, pretty standard ways. Um, the issue becomes when we have functions, traditionally for a function you input some value to it and it's going to apply that value to some scheme, some equational set that it has, and it's going to output an answer to you. Um, you know, if you think about this in computer program, programming, you pass a variable and then a variable is returned after a bunch of stuff has happened to it. Or you pass it five or six variables, it does a bunch of things, and then it passes you something back. Um, that's what's going on in a function. So because a whole bunch of things could happen in the function, and that function could be non-linear in nature, um, we're not exactly equipped with at the moment a good way to propagate the errors through because well, what's going on in the function? How are those errors being applied? So what we're going to do at least to get us a quick little solution for our trig functions and our trig functions remember are sine, cosine, and tangent. Traditionally we just write these as so katoa. Hopefully everybody knows the, the tale of the great Sokotoa, sine, cosine, tangent. But these would also work to the inverse functions or the arc functions of all of these going backwards. They're still functions. Um, we're going to apply a nice method that will work for this function, these six functions, and it'll also work for other functions you have, assuming that you haven't found a weird point on the function where there's a, an immediate strange jump. Okay, so as long as these functions are traditionally um, smooth and continuous, this method will pretty much work for you. Um, that's not guaranteed 100% of the time. If you start getting into some really strange stuff, some really advanced physics, uh, you're probably going to have to look into using more Gaussian distributions um, and start integrating stuff. But for right now, these methods will get us into some things. <laughs> Um, the real coach botzer says, hmm, on um, how they're existing here. So the way we can look at these functions is, let's just take a look at the sine function, okay? This sine function here. If we take a look at the sine function, we're passing sine in angle. And when we pass sine in angle, we're going to get out of it a value ranging from negative one to positive one. And that's just because on the unit circle, if we were to draw it, we know that sine is our vertical values and they range from negative one to positive one. So that's what we know we're gonna get out of that function there. However, when we pass a function or a value to sine some angle, if that angle is measured then what we're really passing to it is sine of theta plus or minus the deviation of that angle, which means we're not just gonna get a value back negative one to one, we're gonna get a value back negative one to one with a little bit of error. I mean, it still has to be within that range of negative one to one, but there's some error associated to it. And because of that, we need to apply a proper error propagation here. The way we're gonna do this is even though the sine function and cosine and tangent function, even though they're curved, and if we look at sine here, we know the sine function looks like this. Even though we know the function is curved, if we were to zoom in very, very close, we can see that maybe at just like a region, this function kind of looks straight. And if I draw a tangent line, they're like, it kind of looks straight there. It looks almost straight enough to kind of be linear. I know it's not, but it's close enough so that if I just took the tiniest little step to each side, that's pretty much on the sine function itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a step forward on the function, that's the positive del theta, and we're going to take a step backwards on the function. That's the negative d theta. And instead of being on the function, we're going to be on this straight line that we drew, this line that's 
not really on the function, but it's close enough that we can say it is. Okay, so we're gonna take a step forward and back. What we'll be able to do is once we take a step forward and a step back, we'll be able to take those values, take the difference of them and divide it by two, and that'll give you, okay, how much wiggle room do you have on each side for where this function will leave you off? Because in theory, this value here, that should be the sine of theta. The value here, that should be plus del theta. And the value we get back here, that should be the value minus del theta. So if we kind of take these values, take the difference of them, and then divide by two, that'll give us a good idea of where we're at in the function. So to do this, we need to find an upper and a lower bounds. So to find the upper bound, what we're going to do is we're just going to call this upper bound u. And we're going to pass into the function. In our case, we're looking at sine. We're just going to pass it theta plus del theta, whatever that value is. We're going to get a value for the upper out of that. Okay. We're then going to find our lower bound. We're just going to call this L. Make life easy. The lower bound for our function, in this case it's sine, but it could be any function, any smooth continuous function, theta minus del theta. So now we've gone up for the upper bound, we've gone down for the lower bound, and then to get the difference between them divided by two, so how much wiggle room do we have forward and backwards, what we're going to do here is we're just gonna take the upper minus the lower divided by two. This is going to give us our deviation. So if sine of the function, if the function, when we pass a variable into it, if that gives us the value of q, if q is just the function, so sine of theta, then this upper minus lower divided by two, this is what the deviation on that value is. So q for sine, that's the value ranging from negative one to one, the del q to that, the upper minus lower, divided by two, that tells us what's the deviation of that answer we got, okay? So that's how we can look at a function. And we can do this for sine, cosine, tangent, all of the inverse functions of those, um, really anything that's smooth. And we can make this assumption where if we take only a little step in each direction, we have a fairly linear line, okay? Um, so that's what we're looking at there. We do need to be a little bit careful in our CD to fraction lab uh, when you are taking the tangent or the inverse tangent to find your angle to begin with. When you do that for the CD lab, you're actually taking the tangent of a length measurement, like how far away uh, or how far the fringes are. So this is like a fringe length plus or minus the fringe length over the CD length, how far away the CD was from the paper, and that's D plus or minus del D. This means that you have to do this division error propagation to get a value for Q and then what you can do is you can say the inverse tangent of this value, q plus or minus del q. So we need to be a little bit careful whenever we use these functions, especially when we're passing in functions, um, different values that we need to divide. But if we just do one error propagation followed by the next, we can do that pretty easily. And just using this idea of the upper and lower bounds for smooth continuous functions that we can assume at small regions forward and backwards are linear, we can use this method right here, okay? So that's how we have our Q, it's just the function, whatever it is, in our case we looked at sine, of the value, del Q is this upper minus lower over two, where we get the upper minus lower by just pushing the function forward a bit and pulling it back a bit. So with that, 
that's how we can use an error propagation through a function here. Um, it's not really that bad, but it is a few steps there. Get some practice with that, try it out in the lab, and see how it goes. With that, air propagations are finished. If you haven't seen any of the previous air propagations, like powers or multiplication division or addition and subtraction, go back to the previous videos and watch them. You'll need them in order to do some of this. Um, and if you're still kind of confused on what are the order of which we should run this air propagation for the CD lab, check out the CD diffraction grading lab overview video as well. And I'll link those all beneath here, okay? But take it easy, see you again.